So today is going to be a real simple, here's a microphone, here's a mixer, here's some speakers, how do I make them work kind of thing. So real simple stuff. Um, and we have props apparently too. Okay. So um, real basic. So the first thing we're going to talk about is just vocal mics today. Um, everyone has probably seen SM58 kind of thing. With microphones, the, the one big difference between them, why are there so many microphones, is firstly the pickup pattern. So on a SM58, it's what's called cardioid. So it's basically a very even pickup pattern across the top and has the most rejection directly behind the microphone. So these are good for people who have a little bit more of a wander when they use the microphone kind of thing, who don't have a very perfect kind of on the mic thing. Um, and then when we're using monitors with these, we ideally want to have the monitor directly behind the microphone because that's the most rejection. Okay, does that make sense so far? 58 is cardioid. It's kind of like a mushroom top, a little more even across the top, um, and most rejection directly behind it. The next one we're going to talk about is a Apex 381. It's a hypercardioid, and what that means is the pickup pattern is directly at the center of it and nothing on the sides and technically a little bit behind it. So with that, I get a bit more distance from the capsule and I get my most rejection at a 45 uh, to a monitor. So for something like that, I would want to have it at a 45 to my mic. So this is going to give me a bit more play this way from the microphone, but it's very tight if I go from side to side, so it will drop up and down kind of thing. So um, these are good for loud stage environments where I have lots of stuff going on, I want to have as much rejection as I can kind of thing. And for the guy who does know how to hold that mic in front of his face <coughs> and give himself just a bit more play from it because nobody wants to be like this, even though you should, nobody wants to be like right on the microphone kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of the two biggest ones. And then from then we go into extremes of them. So for instance, we also have the uh, Audix OM5. It's a uh, hypercardioid as well but extremely tight. So with something like this one, so with my lips right on it kind of thing, I get that volume, but the second I pull away, the volume just drops considerably. So these are great for people and stages again that are quite loud, uh, rock bands, stuff like that and they want to have tons of rejection because as you go to the side, there's nothing. Nothing gets picked up whatsoever. So these are the extreme of those microphones, but again, I have to be on the microphone as it. So comparatively to a, say, SM58. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. So I have more play from the sides as I go kind of thing. Um, I still want to be as close as I can to it, but I still have more play as I go out comparatively to an OM5. So good for guys. This is like the, the everyday mic kind of thing. Um, good place to start. And then also gives me just a bit more play on the microphone from side to side. Uh, then we have our tighter pattern stuff, which is good for the guys who can be right on the microphone and rejects everything crazy from side to side. So the main kind of thing to talk about is that there are so many microphones every, you know, and there's not one perfect mic for everybody and for every situation. So a lot of times we have people come in who say, my mic doesn't work. I say, okay, well, what doesn't work about it? Well, it doesn't sound good. Okay, what doesn't sound good about it? Well, you know, I'm, I'm singing into the microphone and I can barely hear myself. I find that when we're using microphones, the first thing we need to talk about is gain structure. So that's our trim or gain kind of thing. A huge delay. I'm going to get distracted by this for what <laughs> <laughs> um, So the first thing we do when we're using our mixers and our microphones is gain control, is our trim control. That is allowing how much signal to come into the board before I push it out. We want to set that so that we're not too high, so that the mic gain on the mic is just crazy and it's feeding back like crazy and vice versa, not too low, so we have to have the channel fader just rail to get it. And I believe that this is a two person process. The first person is obviously the guy using the mixer. The second person is the person actually using the microphone. 
And this is where, when you come to working with people in stages and stuff like that, there has to be a nice give and take. The first one being a person who talks into a microphone like this, you can't do anything for them. Check, check, one, two, I can't hear myself, what the heck? You have to explain to people that signal in equals signal out. So, you could have the most expensive microphone in the world. If you do nothing to the microphone, it's not gonna work. So having that conversation between the two people makes your life a lot easier. So having a person who can have just a bit more volume into the microphone, I have lots of gain to play with. I'm not gonna have any feedback issues because I can keep that nice and low and everybody wins. Having the person who talks like, I can, you know, can, you turn, can you turn me up in the monitors? I can't quite hear myself. And that's what the problems are gonna indicate. So it's a two person process. It's the person working the mixer and it's also the person going to the microphone. There has to be a give and take on that. So making sure the artists, band members, whatever, help me help you kind of thing. Keep that in mind, you know? So there, like I said, there isn't a magic microphone that's gonna make it just sound amazing and without putting something into the microphone. Fantastic. Um, so we kind of talked about gain structure and that. The next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, dynamic mics versus condenser microphones. Um, dynamic mics, yes, you have to be closer to it. And yes, it gives you the, uh, the best gain to feedback ratio. Condef condenser microphones do pick up a bigger area. But if you, because it picks up such a bigger field, you really have to be careful with them. Um, so we, we want to use condenser microphones sparingly and for the right situations. So we do offer condenser vocal mics as well. And with those, we do get a lot more kind of um, play before we hit uh, feedback. Two, 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 three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15. So for about the same amount of gain that we have as an SM58, we can already tell it's considerably louder because it's picking up a much bigger area as well. Because it's picking up a much bigger area, there's more chance for feedback and stuff. So when you are using condenser microphones in a live situation, the big thing is to pay attention to their pickup patterns. So on this one, it's a super cardioid. So we wanna make sure we have our monitors at a 45 with these ones. It's gonna reject the most at the side of the microphone. So you can see here there's almost nothing being picked up on the side. But dead center is where the, the money spot is, kind of thing. So um, yes, condenser microphones will help you pick up a bigger area of sound with less gain needed to be added. But because they do pick up a bigger area of sound, you need to be careful where you use them and how you use them, kind of thing. Keeping in mind the pickup patterns of microphones. So that's something to consider. Whenever you have mics in your arsenal, I always recommend having multiple ones. Um, for instance, I do a lot of live sound across the chain sort of thing. I always have uh, my Audix OM5s with me, some Sennheiser microphones, some Shure microphones, because depending on the artist I'm working with, not every mic is going to sound amazing on every person. So there again, there isn't a perfect mic for every situation. So having a couple extra microphones, different microphones in your arsenal is a good thing to maybe try doing, um, if that makes sense kind of thing. So. Um, after that, we're going to look at the mixer, it's, the mixer itself. I don't know, do I need to talk to this? Can you guys hear me if I just talk normal? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So, what do all these things do? They look really pretty, and they sure are colorful, but what do they all do? The first thing is our input gain. That's our trim. That's setting how much stuff is coming into the board before we send it out. On most of them, they will have, around the outside, like a plus decibel, minus decibel kind of thing, and they'll say mic level gain, line level. So if you're using a mic, be in this kind of area. If you're using a DI, you'd be in this kind of area. Just guidelines, They're not, there's not, again, a perfect spot to put it. Um, usually on most mixers, you'll have what's called a solo button. And what that does is it shows you how much signal is coming into the board on your little LEDs over here. So that's a great way to start every show. So when every time a band comes in that I'm doing at, say, like Long Branch or whatever, you know, hit the kick kind of thing and you're setting that gain structure, because if you don't set that properly the first time, the monitor mixes you're gonna be adjust, are gonna change, the EQ is gonna change, the main levels are gonna change. So you really wanna make sure you set your gain properly the first time kind of thing. So again, having that person, when they're using that mic, because it is a two person process, give me, give me your singing voice, give me your, your loudest sound so I can set this gain properly kind of thing. 
So having them, you know, like I said, two-person process help you is, is a big thing. Um, is there any questions on that so far? Or not freaking anybody out? Cool. Um, next part we have on most mixers is going to be at least a three-band EQ or a four-band EQ. So on this one, we have highs, sweepable mids, and lows. Now, when we, when we use EQ on these things, um, nine times out of ten, the high or treble is going to be at a set frequency, usually 12 kilohertz. So in our frequency world, we've got 50 hertz down at the bottom and say 20 kilohertz down at the very top. <coughs> Everybody gonna see that? That's sort of yeah. Okay, so when we are adjusting something on the mixer, say at 12 kilohertz, <coughs> say we're taking 12, when we turn it up, it's not just taking that one section and doing that with it, it's actually doing a whole shelving of it. So when you turn 12 up, you're actually doing this. So everything behind it is also going up as well. So kind of keep that in mind when you're adding treble or sibilance, a little is going to do a lot because everything behind it is coming up with it. Does that make sense? So same like on guitar amps and that, they're usually like, you know, your treble knob is a set frequency. As I turn that up, everything with it comes up with it too. So um, little that's a lot on that. The next part we have is our mids. And they're usually, if you have what's called a parametric mid, which means it's a two knob process. The first one is uh, negative and positive. The next one is the actual frequency of that negative and positive. And that's where we're gonna take specific things and push them up and push them down. So for instance, on this one, um, say like on a, a normal vocal mic, a normal vocal sound, 400 hertz is where you get that real boxy kind of sounding thing. If we take that one frequency and pull it down, we're now taking 400 hertz and just taking that one section and bringing it down. So they're really helpful in like feedback situations. So um, knowing your microphones will help you in this situation. Anytime you buy a microphone, that manual you throw away right away, inside that manual, it tells you the frequency spectrum and where the nulls and valleys are in that microphone, which will also help you uh, eliminate problems with those frequencies. For instance, a key come back to the 58, just because most people kind of have them. Um, it has a bump at about two kilohertz, and it has a null around 400 already. So that two kilohertz, if that's the one feeding back, I can select just that frequency and pull it down, thus getting rid of some of that feedback kind of thing. Um, another way to look at doing this is when someone's singing, playing, whatever they're doing, have that, um, have that thing already at, the, at a cut and just take that frequency knob and just start turning and playing until your ears tell you where the sweet spot is kind of thing. Um, a lot of times, depending on the room you're playing in, that frequency from last week might not be a problem this week. So using that sweep can help you clean up a lot of problems. Also gives you um, holes to fit other instruments in. You've only got so much room frequency wise trying to force it all through the same things. Sometimes it can be problematic. So finding sweet spots to pull things down using your EQ can help you with that as well. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yep. So you can deliberately create a spot to put like an instrument in or a voice in or something like instead of just eliminating feedback mm -hmm. you could create that empty spot using the mixer sort of yeah like say for instance um, um, good example say uh, like all my bass instruments my bass guitar my toms my kick whatever I I can lower some top end out of those because I don't, don't want to reproduce those kind of thing to help bring the things that do need top end up. You say, you know, there's, there's only so much room, right, kind of thing, so, yeah, you can use that to carve out, people will say, they carve out, you know, spots for things, sort of thing. Um, different mixers will have different ones. You might have one that's a high, a high mid with a sweep, a low mid with a sweep, and a low, which gives you even more control, kind of thing. You might have digital ones where you have a lot more sweeps you can do, kind of thing, so. Um, that's how we, we we adjust all our different carvings in our holes. We fit things in properly kind of thing. Um, does that make sense? Good. Um, next on your mixer, you should have 
a monitor send. This is how we're going to get to wedges. So on your mixer, it might be called monitor or it might be called auxiliary. Same thing. It's just a way to send a specific mix to a different location. So for instance, I'm going to have my faders control my main mix. I'm going to have this row control my monitor mix. Um, there's two ways you can do this. You can have what's called pre-fader and post-fader. Pre-fader means that once I have this set, um, my faders, if I move it up and down, won't affect my monitor mix. Good for stage wedges, because once you have your monitor set, usually you don't want to change them throughout the show kind of thing, or in-ears, once you change your in-ear mix, you're usually you're good kind of thing. So pre-fader is good for that, so that when his mix is fine, but during the night his vocals are getting tired and he's losing some, some gusto, I can still bring him up in the mains without affecting his monitor mix. Um, the other one is post-fader. Pre-post. Post-fader is the opposite of that then. So once I have my mix set, if I do adjust the fader, it'll adjust that mix accordingly with that. Uh, this will be good for, say, um, effects sends. If you're using, say, like reverbs and that on voices, when you bring that fader up to add more, more um, volume in the, in the mix, you ideally want that effect to come with it. So a big push on a vocal, but you want that reverb just to sound big and huge kind of thing, having it at a post fader would help that. Um, other situations would be, say, if you're using a, um, a, a stage situation with backing tracks, and you have like, people like fading in, fading out, you want to be able to fade that music out and the music goes down on the wedges too, instead of having to come off the mains but still blaring loud in the speakers kind of thing. Uh, I do Folk Fest every year, that's a big one we have, so when the dancers go up, they want to have, when they're walking off the stage, the music's going down with it kind of thing. So instead of having to sit there with two knobs, you can just have one kind of thing. So that's what pre and post kind of does. Any questions on that? No? It's going to be easy. <laughs> oh, so sorry. If yeah. you if you have the post, let's say post fader, for example, yep. turned up quite a bit, mm -hmm. that means that the describe to me again. Yeah. So in a post fade situation, you'd usually set your volume with your fader first, and then use the aux that post fade to bring up. Say, let's talk reverb for now. Oh. We're bringing up reverb for that, and I've got it set there now. It's oh. not physically going to move. But the idea being is when I bring the fader up, more signal is going into that aux, therefore bringing that send up with it. Oh, okay. You're basically adding more of that signal with that fader, which is feeding into that kind of loop sort of thing. That's why it comes up with it and vice versa. When I bring it down, there's less going to that aux and the, the effect will come yeah. down. Oh, I see. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, so I guess the, the next thing would be uh, speakers. And the big one nowadays is self-powered speakers. So for instance, those two guys over there and the one on the ground have the amplifiers built in. Why is that better? Well, the main reason is that the horsepower you're trying to get is at the speaker already. So when you have a, a, a typical amplifier speaker cable situation, think of it as like a garden hose. The longer that garden hose is, by the time that water gets out, it's barely coming out. Having self-powered speakers, that horsepower is there waiting for you, um, so it's way more efficient that way. So any, any mixer that you have that doesn't have amplifiers built in, you can then just run directly to a self-powered speaker, turn it on, all the horsepower is there waiting for you. Um, you can also, say if you have a situation with the church, you've already invested into this powered mixer thing, it's sitting there kind of thing, there are still ways to use power speakers with a self-powered mixer kind of thing, as long as you have like a line output, basically saying, sending a signal before the engine to those speakers. So it's not like, okay, we bought this mixer with all the amps in it, and now it's garbage kind of thing. You can still, you can still get around it kind of thing. Um, the next big thing we, I'd like to talk about too is, is speaker placement. Um, so in a perfect world, uh, are most of you guys from churches or like kind of band situations, churches? So lots, lots of churches kind of thing, yeah. Probably the, the speakers have been there for a very long time, I imagine. Maybe when it very first opened, uh, you know, 1950 or some of that kind of thing. Times have changed, things have changed kind of thing. Believe it or not, back in the day, there weren't wedges. 
you just uh, you just sang loud and people heard you kind of thing. But now everybody wants to be louder. Kind of.